We've now seen a case of projectile motion. When I threw the ball to Bryony, the ball was undergoing projectile motion. What we're going to do now is derive some useful equations to describe projectile motion. So with projectile motion, it's important to remember horizontally, the ball or the projectile is traveling with a constant velocity. Vertically, the projectile is undergoing constant acceleration, which is caused by gravity. So using these and the kinematic equations, we're now going to derive some useful equations for describing the path of a projectile. So we'll be deriving equations to describe the range of a projectile, which is the total distance traveled by the projectile. We'll be calculating the maximum height that the projectile can reach. And we'll also be calculating the time of flight for the projectile. So now what we're going to do is derive our equations for projectile motion. I wouldn't recommend memorizing the equations that we derive, but I do think that it's very important that you are able to derive these for yourselves so that you can show the students how to derive them. So we'll be considering two different cases in, let's call it case A. We'll think about shooting a projectile up off the top of a cliff. We'll let the cliff have some height h above say sea level and the projectile follows a parabolic path like this and the things we're going to want to be calculating are the range which is the total distance it travels and we'll also want to calculate its maximum height and we'll want to get the time of flight as well now case b is more like the ball that we were throwing before. We'll imagine if we throw a ball up off the ground and it comes back down to the ground like this. So we've got some initial velocity, which we'll call u, is at some initial angle theta with the horizontal. And once again, for case b, we've got a range and we've got a maximum height. And we'll also look at the time of flight. So these two cases are very, very similar. Case B is really just a special case of A with H equal to zero. Now, in order to work out our equations, we'll be making use of our kinematic equations. So we'll be using V is equal to U plus AT. We'll also need S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared. And we'll need V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. And what we'll do is we will consider the horizontal motion and the vertical motion separately. So horizontally, the first thing we're going to want to do is get our initial velocity in the horizontal direction. So we've got the velocity going up like this. It's some vector U and we can split it into components. We've got the angle theta here. This is from over here, we've got this theta here. And so here we've got ux, here we've got uy. And from trigonometry, we know that cos theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, so ux over u. I haven't drawn the vector underneath the u here because this is the magnitude of u. So if I wanted, I could write it like this but um, I won't from now on to save myself some time. I'll just write u. So we can say, well, ux is equal to u cos theta. That's the initial velocity in the x direction. Now, horizontally, there is no acceleration. When a projectile is launched, there is no horizontal force acting on it. If we want to get really technical, we could consider air resistance, but we don't. Air resistance is small and we generally assume that we can ignore it. So horizontally, the acceleration is equal to zero. So we can look at our kinematic equations. We've got V is equal to U plus AT. In this case, A is zero. So that tells us that VX is equal to UX. And if we wanted to say this in English, we'd say the speed is not changing because the final speed is equal to the initial speed. So this implies it's going at a constant speed. 
Now, where that S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared, again, the acceleration is zero, so we've got that our displacement in the X direction is equal to UXT. So if we know how long it's in the air for, then we can work out how far it's gone. And the final one, V squared equals U squared plus 2AS, the A once again is zero, so we end up with VX squared is equal to UX squared, but that doesn't tell us anything extra. That's just the same as this first equation here. So we have these equations here to describe the motion in the horizontal direction. Now vertically, we can work out our initial velocity, this UY up here. So UY is equal to U sine theta. And that comes about because sine theta is equal to opposite, which is uy over u. So just rearranging, we end up with uy is equal to u sine theta. Okay, now vertically we do have acceleration. The acceleration is equal to g and it's directed downwards. So g here is just the acceleration due to gravity. So we can write out our kinematic equations in the vertical direction. We've got Vy is equal to Uy. Now, this is initially going up and the acceleration's down, so it's minus gt. So that's our first kinematic equation and it will tell us how fast it's going after a certain time in the y direction. Now, with our s equation, we've got Sy is equal to Uyt and Again, u is going up and a is going down. So these are in opposite directions. So we've got a negative sign. So minus a half gt squared. And then finally, we've got vy squared is equal to uy squared minus, because again, the acceleration is downward. So minus 2gs. So when I'm substituting in here, I use g is equal to 9.80 or 9.81 if we use the average over the earth. I'm not using a negative value for g because I've already got my negative value in the equation. Okay, so I've now written out my kinematic equations horizontally and vertically. And now what I can do is use these kinematic equations to come up with expressions for my time of flight, my range, and my maximum height. So let's scroll up a little bit to give ourselves some room, and then we can look at time of flight. Okay, so to get the time of flight, we're actually going to need to split our time into two components. So what we'll be doing is we'll be working out the time for it to go from the initial position to maximum height. So from here to here, and then we'll work out the time for it to go from maximum height down to ground level. Calculate from launch to maximum height, and then from max height to ground. Okay, so starting with one, from launch to maximum height, we'll need to consider what's happening at maximum height. And when it's at maximum height, the vertical velocity has to be zero. So at maximum height, we've got uy, sorry, vy, the current velocity, vy is equal to zero. So why is that? Well, let's assume that isn't true. Let's assume that vy was positive. This means that it's got a positive velocity upwards, and if it's still moving upwards, then it can't be at the maximum height. By definition, it would go a little bit higher. And let's assume it was negative. If it was negative, then this would imply that it had been moving downwards for a little bit. And if it had been moving downwards for a little bit, then it would be below the maximum height. So at exactly the maximum height, Vy has to be zero. If you want to do that more mathematically, you can differentiate and show that it needs to be a turning point. But I think the physical argument is nice in this case. Okay, so we know that at maximum height, Vy equals zero. We're trying to find out how long it get, takes to get to maximum height. And so we're going to want to use our equation, Vy is equal to Uy minus gt. And so we can rearrange this. We're trying to find t, so let's make t the subject. And we've just said, well, this Vy here, this is equal to zero. 
So we have GT is equal to UY, which we can say T is equal to uy over g and we know that ui is equal to u sine theta over g so we've now calculated the time it takes to get to maximum height and this applies in both case a here and case b here okay so we've done part one now what we need to do is time from maximum height to the ground and in order to work out that time, we're going to need to work out, well, how far does it have to travel? So we're actually going to have to work out what the maximum height is. Okay, so in order to work out the maximum height, we'll actually be making use of this equation at the top now. We'll be making use of Sy is equal to Uyt minus a half gt squared and we have just worked out how long it takes to get to maximum height so we know how long it's been in the air for so we've got uy which we said was equal to u sine theta times g which we've said is u sine theta on g so this is just substituting this expression that we've obtained here for this t minus a half g and now we've got t squared so this is u squared sine squared theta over g squared squaring everything there okay so we've got sy the height it reaches is equal to u squared sine squared theta over g minus a half here we've got this g will cancel with one of these so those cancel u squared sine squared theta over g and so we've got u squared sine squared theta on g minus a half u squared sine squared theta on g so that's equal to a half u squared sine squared theta over g so this sy this is the height above launch height so looking at this diagram for case a this is the height here this is sy that we've cancelled uh, calculated for case B, it is the maximum height. So if we want to get the maximum height for case A, we then have to add on this H here. Okay, so maximum height is equal to H plus a half U squared sine squared theta on G for case B. This works, but we've got h is equal to zero okay so what we were trying to work out was the time that it takes to travel to the ground so now we know how far it has to travel and what we want to work out is the time it takes to do so so looking back at our kinematic equations here in the vertical direction we know the height that it has to go so we know sy we're trying to find t so we need to have a t in this equation we don't know what the final velocity is. We're considering the part of the motion, just scrolling up again, from here to here. So initially, when it's at maximum height, we've said that uh, uy is equal to zero at this point when we're considering this as our initial time. And so we know uy. So we're going to want to use this equation here because it we know the height, we know uy, and we're trying to find t. So let's start with that equation. We've got sy is equal to uyt minus a half gt squared. And at maximum height, the velocity is equal to zero, which tells us that uy is equal to zero, as initially it is at maximum height. So notice that we've chosen new initial conditions. For the first part where we were calculating the time to maximum height, the launch place was the initial conditions. For the second half of the flight, we're considering the top of the parabola as the initial positions. And the initial location is S is equal to zero. So the final location is actually going to be sy is equal to minus this thing minus h 
minus a half u squared sine squared theta on g because it ends up below the initial position. Okay, so now let's substitute this in. We've got minus h minus a half u squared sine squared theta on g is equal to minus a half g t squared. Okay, and what we're trying to find is g. So we can cancel out all these negative signs to start with. So let's make them all positive. And now we're going to times everything by 2 over g. So we end up with t squared is equal to 2h on g plus u squared sine squared theta over g squared. Okay, so t is equal to the square root of 2h on g u plus u squared sine squared theta on g squared. So that's the expression for case B, where it lands at the same height it started from, this h is 0. So we have a simpler expression. We have t is equal to the square root of u squared sine squared theta on g squared. And when we take the square root of that, we end up with u sine theta over g. Now, what it's useful to note is that for case B, we've got this coming down and going up. We've already calculated the time here. So you can see for case B, it takes the same time to get up as it does to get down, which makes sense because it's symmetric. Okay, so we've now calculated the time up and the time down, so we can calculate the total time. It's We just need to sum them together, the time up plus time down. So this is equal to u sine theta on g plus the square root of 2h on g plus u squared sine squared theta on g squared. So that's for case A. For case B, this is also u sine theta g, so we end up with 2u sine theta on g. A simpler expression. Okay, so we've got our total time. Next, what we're going to want to calculate is our range. So looking back here, we're trying to get the total distance that the projectile has traveled. So in order to do that, we know that horizontally it's traveling with a constant speed. And so if we can just multiply the speed by the time it spends in the air, that's going to give us the displacement. That's what this equation tells us here, which is the range. Okay, so what we find the range so we know that the range is just the horizontal distance traveled, which is equal to ux times t. And we said ux was equal to u cos theta. And t, we've calculated, it's up here. So this is times u sine theta on g plus the square root of 2h on g plus u squared sine squared theta on g squared. Okay, so that's probably as simple as we can do it for case A. If we, we can do it a bit more simply for case B. We've got that our range is equal to u cos theta. And in this case, our t was given by 2u sine theta on g. So this is equal to 2u squared cos theta sine theta on g. Now it's absolutely fine to use it in this way if you want to. It's just sometimes you will see some textbooks presented in a different way. So I'm going to show you now how to get to that different way, but you don't have to use that different way if you don't want to. Okay, so how we can simplify this a little bit is using some trigonomic formulas. So we know that sine a plus sine b can be written as 2 sine a plus b on 2 cos a plus b on 2. So what's nice here is that we've got a 2 sine something times cos something and up here we've got a 2 
sine something times cos something. The order that we multiply in doesn't matter. So we can have this in exactly this form if we let a equal 2 theta and b equal 0. In that case, we've got sine of a, which we, we're saying is 2 theta, plus sine of b, which we're saying is 0, is equal to 2 sine of a plus b. So that's 2 theta plus 0 on 2 times cos of 2 theta plus 0. Sorry, that should be a minus. This is my mistake. This is a minus. This is a minus on 2. And so this is equal to 2 sine theta. Two, yeah, theta, because we've got 2 theta divided by 2. So 2 sine theta cos theta. So what we've just shown is that sine 2 theta plus sine 0. Now sine 0, that's equal to 0. So we're saying sine of 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta cos theta. That's just setting this side equal to this side. Okay, so... If we substitute in for 2 cos theta sine theta, that's equal to sine 2 theta, then we've got our range is equal to u squared times this, which is sine 2 theta on g. So this is for case b, where it looks like this and comes back to the same height. So sometimes you will see this equation written. I'm not absolutely positive that it's worth using, but if you see it, that is where it comes from. So now we've seen how to calculate the range, which is how far a projectile goes, how to calculate the time of flight, and how to calculate the maximum height. So I recommend now that you have a go at solving a few projectile motion questions to put these to practice. I don't recommend that you memorize these formulas. I think it's more useful being able to derive them so that if the question changes slightly, so for example, if you move from case A to case B, you know how to adapt your equations to count, account for that specific case.